The scripture this morning is from Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead, and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of God for the people be, people of God. In prayer. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, and let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. So this worship series during the season of Lent, along with the book study that we're doing here on Sunday mornings and on Monday evenings, all of this is really focused on each one of us learning to forgive others, on each of us becoming a more forgiving person. But I believe that the journey to forgiving others begins with the experience of being forgiven. You can't do what you've never seen done. You can't give to others what you've never received yourself. The book of Ephesians says to forgive one another, not on our own initiative, not out of our own goodness. It says to forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. You see, forgiveness starts. Forgiveness comes out of our relationship with God. Again, I want to say this journey to forgiving other people begins with the experience of being forgiven. So, I want to be right up front with you today. Uh, This is where the sermon is headed. This is what I want you to take home with you today. The God of love is running to meet you with arms wide open, with a heart full of joy. Won't you receive the forgiveness that God so freely offers. I want to tell you a story today. It's sort of a, well, it's an embarrassing story, uh, as you will discover. Uh, it, many years ago, probably 12 or 13 years ago, I had to drive one Saturday to Akron, 
for a, a church meeting. Uh, it was a, you know, it's a pretty productive meeting actually, and I, I felt good about things. I was in a good mood as I, as I left the church where I, I was and got in my car to drive home, and I, I got on, uh, found my way back to I-76 West. You know where I'm talking about up there in northeast Ohio, I-76 West, and after a while I, I turned on to I-71. Now many of you know about me that I'm a bit of a college basketball fan and there was an OSU men's basketball game on the radio that day. It was an important game. That particular year the the Buckeyes were in contention for the league championship. In fact they went ahead and won the Big Ten that year and this was an important game along the way. The Buckeyes were playing at Northwestern that day, and Northwestern was just playing great. Northwestern was up by 10 points at halftime, but then as I listened on the radio, this will tell you how long ago it was, Jamar Butler came out in the second half, and he just kind of took over the game, and the Buckeyes had this big comfortable lead until the last two minutes, and you know how those last two minutes sometimes are, and the Buckeyes started turning the ball over right and left, and Northwestern started making threes, and they pulled within two points, and it was finally Terrence Dials. Remember the big guy? Terrence Dials pulled down those big rebounds. He made some key free throws down the stretch, and the Buckeyes survived for a conference road win. Now, you might be wondering what this 12- or 13-year-old basketball game has to do with forgiveness. You might even be wondering what this 12 or 13 year old basketball game has to do with the kind of embarrassing story that I promised to tell you. Well, here it is. You see, so intent was I on listening to that basketball game on the radio that I somehow got on I-71 northbound instead of I-71 southbound, and so intent was I on listening to that basketball game that I wasn't really paying attention to the, the landmarks away, along the road, and, and so intent was I on listening to that basketball game that the next thing I noticed was a sign that said, Jacob's Field, next right. And the first thing I thought to myself is, Oh, I wonder if I've been going the wrong way. (laughs) Yeah, like a whole hour the wrong way. And the next thing that I remember asking myself was, well, what am I going to do? As though there was sort of more than one option, you know. (laughs) There's really not. When, When you have been driving the wrong direction, or to kind of get to the point of the story, when you have been living in the wrong direction, even for a long time, there's really only one thing you can do. you got to turn around and go back. And in driving, we call that making a U-turn, right? And in life, we call that confession and repentance. And you know, that much of the story, that's pretty good, isn't it? Kind of a little fable about life and driving and repentance. But the truth is the story is really a little more complicated than that because back home in Columbus, in my absence, this was a very hectic and stressful day for my family. Both of our daughters, who were still young then, couldn't drive. They, they had to go several places that day. There was a, a birthday party, and there was a, a dance lesson, and there was a Girl Scout meeting. And my wife, Carolyn, had two or three places that she had to go. Uh, and Carolyn and I had talked that out the night before. And I assured Carolyn, don't worry about it. I'll be home from my meeting by 4 o'clock. Absolutely no later than 4 o'clock. Because you see, everything that day came to a head at about 5 o'clock. When every member of the family had to be in a different place at the same time, I said, don't worry about it. I'll be back in time to, to get everybody where they need to go. But of course, well, now that I had accidentally driven to Cleveland... I wasn't going to be home by 4 o'clock. I wasn't going to be home by 5 o'clock, probably not even by 5.30. And I knew, as I drove along, I knew that I really needed to call Carolyn and share with her this mm, new information. Um, 
and I drove a little farther knowing that I really needed to call Carolyn, and I drove a little farther knowing I really, really needed to call Carolyn. Of course, what, what prevented me from making that call is that running through my mind were the sorts of things that some wives might say to their husbands in a situation like that, such as, well, what do you mean you're not going to be home at four? You promised. Or perhaps something a little less kind, such as, well, what am I going to tell your girls? They can't go to their birthday party because their father doesn't know north from south. You know, things like that. And, and here's what Carolyn actually said. She said, so you drove to um, Cleveland. Well, all right. I'll figure something out. I'll call somebody else to to get the girls where they need to go. And then remembering that I had been having a lot of troubles with my eyes recently, Carolyn thought to ask, and how's your vision? Are you doing okay? And the last thing she said was, "I'll, I'll try to have something ready for supper when you get home. You see, when you have been driving or when you have been living in the wrong direction, even for a long time. What makes it good (laughs) to turn around and go back home is grace on the other end of the line. In fact, I, I would go so far as to say when you have been driving or when you have been living in the wrong direction for a long time, the only thing that makes it possible to place that phone call, huh? the only thing that, that makes it possible to turn around and go back home is that you know deep in your heart that there's not going to be judgment or rule enforcement on the other end of the line, but there's going to be grace and forgiveness. You know, the truth is, even though I really did hesitate to make that call, I mean, you understand that, right? I did know. I, I, I knew the sort of thing that Carolyn was likely to say. I'd known her a long time. I know her heart. And if I really thought that she was going to lambast me, if I really thought that she was going to hold my foolishness against me, well, I'd have probably been tempted to just keep driving. Jacob's field it is, you know. <laughs> but here's, here's what she said. She said, well, I'll figure something out. How are your eyes doing? Are you okay? They'll, I'll try to have something waiting for your supper when you get home. Once upon a time, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. Now, we're going to talk about the other son, the older son, next Sunday. But today, we're thinking about that younger son. You know, the one who broke his father's heart, the one who took his share of the inheritance, his share of the family money, and he went far away and he wasted it. He squandered it all on absolutely shameful living. He lived in the wrong direction so far that he wound up feeding pigs. I mean, think about it, a Jew feeding pigs. He lived so far in the wrong direction that that he'd have been glad to trade places with those pigs. They had more to eat, better to eat than he did. Who knows why it is that we go far away? Who knows why it is that we break our parents' hearts and quarrel with our siblings? Who knows why it is that we get involved in drugs and alcohol or act out sexually or distance ourselves from the very people who love us. Who knows why we live in the wrong direction. But all too often, in ways both big and small, that's exactly what we do, isn't it? But a better question yet is why is it that we turn around and go back home. Partway through Jesus' story, when the money had ran out and the wine was gone and the women had all moved on, all of a sudden, it says the younger son came to himself. Did you hear that phrase? He came to himself. All of a sudden, he realized that he wasn't really somebody who eats pig slop, you know. He wasn't really somebody who would disrespect his father. He wasn't really somebody who would spend his money on prostitutes. I mean, he'd done all of those things, yes, but it's not who he really was. He knew deep inside or at least he kind of vaguely remembered that who he really 
was, was the precious son of a loving father. Who knows why we, we would turn around and go back home. Well, it's because we know deep inside or, or we at least vaguely remember who we are. We are a precious child of a God who loves us no matter what. We are the precious child of a God who has said that whenever you want to come home, <laughs> the door will be open and my arms will be open wide. Whenever you want to confess your sins, I will forgive you. In fact, as I shared uh, on Wednesday at the Ash Wednesday service, the news is really even more amazing than that. God doesn't even wait for us to confess. God has already forgiven us. It says in Romans 5 that while we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, Jesus gave his life for us. That proves God's love for us. And you remember in the story today, the father doesn't wait for the son to get home and make his confession. He sees him from far away, and he goes out and he gives him a big hug and a kiss before he's ever said a word. Remember what I want you to take home with you today? Here's what I want you to take home with you today. The God of love is running to meet you with arms wide open and a heart filled with joy, won't you receive the forgiveness that God so freely offers? You know, doctrine, what we believe, really does matter. Not in the way I think that General Conference said that it matters in terms of enforcing rules, but what we believe about God really does matter. And there's so many people who kind of believe that God is angry and harsh. They believe that God is some kind of cosmic rule enforcer. Uh, in fact, one of the most common understandings of, of Christian salvation is called penal substitution theology. And according to this kind of theology, uh, th that God sent Jesus to die on the cross in order to satisfy God's wrath about sin, that God couldn't just forgive people because God is so committed to justice and to keeping the rules, but that before God could forgive, somebody had to pay the price, somebody had to pay the penalty for our forgiveness. But as Robin Collins has pointed out, if that were really true, Jesus would have had to tell a different story. The story that Jesus would have told would have been that when the younger son finally came to himself and went back home, well... The father waited inside with a scowl on his face and his arms crossed. And when the son had finally groveled on the ground long enough, the father said to the son, Now you know, son, I can't just up and forgive you. It would break the moral order of the universe if I did. And, and the father would say, now, now I can't forgive you until somebody pays the price for what you have done. And, you know, I think if the father had said that, the son probably would have said, Oh, never mind. I think I made a mistake ever coming back here. In fact, if the son had known that the father was going to say something like that, he'd have probably just kept driving north. Jacob's field, it is. Not going back there. But see, the reason Jesus tells us this story is that he wants us to know that God is not like that. That theology is wrong. God is really like the Father in this story. And however far away we may go, and however wrong and hurtful our life may become, there's always one who's looking out for us until we turn around and come back home. There is always on the other end of the line, not judgment, not enforcement of the rules, on the other end of the line, there is always grace, sweet grace. And our shame will not be met with further blame. And what we have done wrong won't be held against us. And the fact that I have somehow driven to Cleveland instead of Columbus won't seem to matter at all. The only thing that matters is that I'm home. And there will even be some supper waiting on the stove. <laughs> 
throughout this Lenten season again, where, where we're going, our focus is on each one of us learning to forgive others, each one of us learning to be a more forgiving person, for each one of us to pray for God to soften our hearts so that we can let stuff go and, and we can live in peace and reconciliation with each other. But remember, the forgiveness to forgiving others begins with this experience of being forgiven. You can't give to others what you haven't experienced yourself. And so right after the benediction today, not some other day, but today, I've invited a couple of people, Susie Martin and Susan Place, and they're just going to kind of hang out here in the front of the sanctuary to pray with you or to listen to you or to talk with you, to, to be with you however is important to you today. And if And if today there's something you just need to get off your chest, if today is a day you would like to turn your life around and not go to Jacob's field after all, but to go back towards God, if today is the day you just need somebody to say, I love you and I forgive you, well, you're in luck. This is the day. (laughs) Just come and talk to to Susie or, or to Susan after the worship today. You don't have to know what you're going to say in advance. You don't have to have an agenda. Just come. May I say it to you one more time. What I want you to take home with you today is this. The God of love is running to meet you with arms wide open and a heart filled with joy. Won't you receive the forgiveness that God so freely offers? And that is where the journey to forgiveness begins.